Great to see you all today, and look forward to opening the Word of God with you. So if you would, go ahead and open to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. And Daniel was right, by the way. That was a good word of truth there. Daniel said about the Lord loves a banjo. And actually in the Old Testament where it says David played the lyre, that's a translated banjo. So just in case you were wondering. <laughs> just in case you wondered about that. We're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 2 for a couple of weeks. Then we'll have a, a guest uh, on the 15th of June. Um, Kevin Smith will be speaking about um, missionary work to Mexico and some other places which y'all are tied very closely to. And I really look forward to hearing him and getting to know him a little better like some of you all do. Then we will be going into the book of First Peter. And I hope that you all have read through that. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to do that several times. I'll uh, have a little reading schedule in the bulletin too, I believe, if you'd like to kind of follow along with everybody, reading, reading a couple chapters each day kind of thing. Um, and then we'll just pour ourselves into that book. It'll be a, a great time together. Really look forward to it. I love just systematically going through books so we can get the big picture of what the writer is trying to say. It's very healthy for us individually and for the church as a whole. Well, the book of Acts chapter 2. We'll just take a glimpse into this book for the sake of the church. I've done a lot of that in recent weeks, just thinking what would be good for our church. Uh, what's going to be healthy for us to look at from Scripture to help us understand what we're about, uh, where we should be headed, what direction we should head in, just some healthy things for the church from a pastoral perspective. And boy, we can really find a lot of this in the book of Acts throughout the entire book of Chapter 2 is almost like a microcosm of church health and things, it's just almost like a list of things that we can look at and apply to our church from the early church, things that are apostolic, things that the apostles taught and did in the church. Now this book is designed not so much to be a didactic book or a teaching book, like some books are more theological in nature. Um, there are deep theological truths. You can certainly find some deep truths here too, of course. But it's more a history of the early church. And so we're going to take a look at chapter 2 just this week and next week and just pull out some simple things to show you that will help us tremendously. And our goal is this. We want to be a well-balanced church. A lot of times people uh, focus or churches focus on the practical things of ministering, they forget that, hey, we need these deep theological truths. We need to understand doctrine. And then sometimes we go to the other extreme and we're all about doctrine, and, but we never flesh that out. So we need to be orthodox. We need to have orthodoxy in our church. And we need to have orthopraxy as well, which is actually practicing those things. So we need to have proper orthodox and then practice those things. That is a sign of a healthy church. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. They understood the deep theological truths from God, the things the apostles taught them. They longed to understand those things and grasp those things, but they didn't leave it there. They fleshed them out in the church. They practiced those things. So that is what we need to kind of use as our foundation as we begin to look at these things. Nothing real fancy in the next couple of weeks, just some simple, plain truths that will help us. Now we're looking at this whole chapter, so I'm not going to read it because it's kind of lengthy, I'll read it as we go through our points. So, I believe this is the first, by the way, this is the day of Pentecost, which this is what they were experiencing here in Acts chapter 2 as well. So here's the first thing I want you to see in our text, that there was purposeful unity within the church. Look at verse 1 in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived... They were all together in one place. Now, I don't want you guys to miss what is happening in this first verse here, in this passage. What we see is unity, bold, purposeful unity. That was major to the early church. Not the first church, because we are part of the first church, right? The church is the church. But the early church, in its infancy, there was bold, 
purposeful unity because that pictured so much. When the church is unified, it pictures the Godhead and it points people to Jesus. So unity is a powerful thing within the church. And this really sets the tone for everything that follows in this passage. It seemed like every time the apostles got, which is what we see here, the apostles getting together, that God would do something in their midst. And I think this is vital in the church, in the early church, obviously, and in the contemporary church. I don't think this is merely an observation on my part. It's not, at least in this verse, it, it, it is a clear theological truth. I think it's found throughout Scripture that when the church gets together, God works in incredible ways. And that togetherness is extremely important in the life of any church. That includes its leaders and its members as well. They had come together to hear from God. This is what was happening. They were seeking direction and instruction and guidance from the Lord and simply the glory of God. So we clearly see in Acts chapter 2 unity within the church. We come together for unity. Folks, I cannot stress this enough. And it's more than just saying, all right, we need unity. It's we look inwardly in and of ourselves, each of us individually and say, okay, where is it in my life that I am causing disunity within a church, if that is indeed the case? Check ourselves and see if that is the case. And then we say, all right, I turn from that and I repent of that so the church can come together and be unified. There is nothing greater than a unified church in Christ. So naturally, you're going to see as I give these points that one thing flows right out of the other. So initially we see unity in the church. They came together and God did a work among them of unity. Here's the second thing. God was the driving force behind all of this. Look at verses 2 through 6 in our text in chapter 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in to uh, other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven... And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. What an amazing series of events that begin to take place here. I mean, just really mind-boggling to us when we think about it really happening. And if you could put yourself in their shoes and seeing this happen. So they were all gathered together for Pentecost. And God began to do this incredible work among them. And listen to what I said there. God began to do this because it was God doing it. And so often, guys and gals, we get together as a church and we say, what can we do to make things better? What can we do to draw a crowd? What can we do to make something phenomenal happen? We can do nothing. Amen. Really. God does it, and we really clearly need to see that God is the driving force. And we see in verses 2 through 6, God is glorifying himself by uh, being the driving force in the church. We have to be so very careful when it comes to this issue of speaking in tongues that, that he's speaking of in verses 2 through 6. And in this case, this specific case, it was because so many were gathered together from so many countries. They spoke different languages. And God took it upon himself to say, I'll get them all together and give them a language they can all understand. God did that. And I say that because uh, of some things that I have witnessed and maybe you yourself. And so often this issue of speaking in tongues becomes a very man-centered thing. Man-centered because the focus ends up being on the person that is doing it or who has done it. And that is not what we see in Scripture. Anytime, we took a look at this recently on Wednesday night. 
uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Anytime we see this issue of tongues coming up in Scripture, whether you believe tongues have ceased or if you think they exist today, whatever, that's for another discussion another day. But whatever your stance on it is, we can absolutely say this, it is not about us. It is a God-centered thing. And often I've seen where people speak in tongues and because they're supposedly doing that, then they are super spiritual and the focus becomes on them. When that happens, scratch it off. That's not what it's about, folks. It absolutely is not. So we need to understand that, that it was a God-driven thing. God is always the driving force behind the church in every aspect, in every, and especially in this context. If we were to read further down the passage, we would see, again, where folks came from all over different nationalities, different countries, and they gathered to celebrate Pentecost, and, and uh, they didn't understand. They could not have understood what Peter was about to preach, what he was preaching, unless God had met in their midst and did something great. So the church should let God be the driving force in everything we do. And isn't that liberating? I mean, isn't it? It's not up to me, folks, or Sean, or any of our, our deacons, or Sunday school teachers, or any leaders to make this church successful. It's just not. And whoever this next pastor will be, folks, don't depend upon him. He cannot do it in and of himself. God is a driving force to any church. Here's the third thing that I think we clearly see. And again, it flows right out of the, the last point, that God being the driving force, because God was a driving force, it was a God-centered church. Look at verse 7 in our text. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Again, they begin to realize what God was doing. They were, they, were, they were like, wait, how can this be happening? Because there's different people here. There's different things going on. But somehow they all understand what is happening here. So the, the emphasis was, was taken off of the apostles. And it slowly began to be focused upon God, which is what the church, of course, should do. Again, this is a natural outflow of the understanding that God was a driving force. So, because of that, the entire story is a God-centered happening. It's not man-centered. It is very God-centered. So, I ask you the question, does it matter if, if we are God-centered? And I emphatically say yes. So, here's how one pastor put it concerning he and his church being a God-centered church. Listen to this quote. He says, The psalmist describes the motivation of God in saving sinners like this. Both we and our fathers have sinned, yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. That's Psalm 106, verses 6 and 8. And he goes on to say, God was motivated to rescue them and us from our sin and its penalty for His name's sake. What does for His name's sake mean? It means that He might make known His mighty power. What we mean when we say God is God-centered is that He acts like that. He saves for the sake of His name. He saves to make known His power. And what we mean when we say we are God-centered or desire to be is that we like to have it that way. It satisfies us to have God save us for God's sake. We are happy that this is the way it is. We get pleasure in seeing it and savoring it. We like to talk about God doing it in that way. And that pastor was absolutely right. When we get to the point that we realize it's all about God and for His name's sake and everything He does is for His glory and our good, it changes everything in the church. Everything. And we begin to take the focus off of man 
and it goes directly to God for His name's sake. And you begin to, to savor that. The more you hear about God, the sweeter it is to us. The more you hear about how majestic He is and glorious He is and how deserving He is of our praise, the more we savor that and enjoy that. That is a God-centered people and a God-centered church. Folks, that is what we want to be. It's all about Him. This is where we need to be as a church. We simply need to be God-centered. Listen, folks, you cannot go wrong by being God-centered and giving glory to God where it absolutely belongs. You just cannot go wrong there. But when you begin to focus on personalities and people and what we can do, everything gets out of kilter. So be careful in giving the glory to God and being God-centered. There'd be no church without God, correct? There'd be no salvation without God. So why would we focus on ourselves? By the way, this is vital in evangelism as well. When we are focused on God and His glory... Others will be attracted to His beauty and His greatness. And that's God's perfect plan. When we, when we put the focus on somebody's personality, whether it be a pastor or a singer or whatever, that glory is very short. It's very fainting and temporal. Very much so. And, and that person will fail you. Every time I go to a church as a pastor, I, I make clear. I announce it. I say, look, folks. I will fail you. I absolutely will. I, I don't intend to. That's not my desire. I'll do my best not to fail you. But I'm human. I will fail you. And so will everybody else. <laughs> everybody. It's said, it, I've said it often that I believe God will allow everybody around you to fail you until your focus is on Him. That's just the way He has it planned. But when we're focused not on us who will fail each other, but on God who will never fail us, and we, we point people to His beauty and His glory, others are attracted to that. And they go, wow, He is a great God. He's a glorious God. How do I get to know Him? That's what God-centeredness does. So we see in Acts chapter 2 that the early church was indeed God-centered. Here's the fourth thing, which again naturally flows out of the last point. Because it was God-centered, there was unity in Christ. Now, we're talking about unity again, but we're getting a little more specific. And we're, how do we have unity in God? It's in and through Christ. That's His plan. That's how it happens. If we indeed want to be, have unity as a church, it's going to happen through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Again, it's clear in the passage that God was definitely at work here. And He took the initiative and He is the one that worked in their midst and gave them all understanding. Remember in this setting where the, they were from different countries and nationalities and, and God gave them all understanding so they could know what Peter was preaching in his sermon. Before that, they were as scattered men from scattered countries without understanding, striving on their own and in their own power to understand what was being said among them. So let's look at verses 8 through 12 to see what was happening here. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and uh, Pamphylia and Egypt, all parts of the Libya belonging to Serene, and visitors from Rome, so all of these places, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying one another, what does this mean? Now can you imagine being in that setting and hearing this and seeing what was taking place? And somehow you're thinking, wait, he's not from around here. But he's understanding what this guy is preaching about. What's happening here? And this is what happens when God is central. When we're God-centered. When, when we all realize it's about God and all we do is with that in mind, 
when all our decisions are based on God through Christ, then unity is sure, absolutely, to follow. So he brought these people that were scattered and he began to preach Jesus and they were all brought together. There was unity. And, and so let me just ask you, how do you know you were God-centered instead of man-centered? How do you go to determine that? Where do you go to say, well, I understand the importance of being God-centered through Christ. I understand that importance now, but how do we know? Where do we go? Well, it's actually pretty simple, folks. Right there. It's amazing how this book is and the answers it has, but we tend to just kind of set it aside so often and we get so out of sorts and um, off track. But here is where you find out if you're God-centered. Just pick it up and read it. No particular place, just read it. And you begin to see that God is everything and we are unified as a church through Christ. We see that in Scripture. That's another reason why the Bible is focused on at this church and has been for many, many, many years. So it's really a no-brainer if we want a unified church. We read and we feed and we need God's Word. Cannot stress it enough. Cannot. And I love... I love to see Sunday mornings. Man, it's just so encouraging to walk in here and see all these classes meeting together and they open God's Word. They open it up and begin to, to read it and teach and say, here's what it says. That is a glorious thing. Never stop. There will be great pressure from the outside in years to come, months and years to come, to stop that. It's not relevant. It's, it's even um, it, it maybe even illegal one day. But never, ever stop. It's God's breath and we breathe God's breath. So here's the fifth thing that we see that we can model ourselves after in this early church. Opposition is part of the church experience. I wish I didn't have to say that, but it is. It's a natural thing. Opposition is part of the church experience. Look at verse 13, what begins to happen here. But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. So this miracle really was happening where all these scattered people were together and God gave them understanding. Peter was preaching and they all understood. And you would have thought everybody would have said, wow, this is amazing. God, you are awesome. This is incredible. But look what they started. They're drunk. Those people are drunk. And isn't there, there's naysayers all the time. There's people all the time. You just need to realize that that is the case. It never ceases to amaze me with young guys who are, especially the ones who aren't in church much and God saves them and, and just does a great work in their lives and they feel called to preach, you know, so they go straight to, to college, then to seminary, and then right into a church and then they begin to call somebody, another pastor at 2 o'clock in the morning saying, what have I got myself into? <laughs> what is going on here? I'm just preaching the word and they're rising up against it. Well, it's nothing new. It's a natural experience. Why? Because we have sinful flesh wrapped upon us and it's our nature in one sense. And we struggle with the flesh and part of the flesh is that we are naysayers at time. And this is what happens. And folks, this is extremely valuable to us for us to remember. Anytime you strive to glorify God, anytime you simply surrender to His will and His way, anytime you seek to be God-centered, there will be opposition. Just understand that. And think about what's happening here. God is doing an amazing thing. He's bringing people together, unifying them through His Son Jesus, and some mock and say, they're drunk. And that's okay. It's all right. You're not, it's just, it's going to be that way to some degree or the other. That's all right. Just step back and, and know that, that it's nothing new. And as long as people are human, which we're going to be, it's going to happen. And there are ways to deal with it, which brings us to our sixth thing. At times there is 
public refutation needed. Look at verse 14 and following. But Peter, standing there, uh, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Maybe later on, but right now it's too early. <laughs> but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and he begins to share with them. So let's read it, verse 17. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs uh, on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the, that, uh, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So through apostolic authority, authority given from God, Peter rebukes the naysayers and lets them know that God is up to something. This is what a prophet the prophet in the sense of forth teller does. And he uses the word of God to do it. And this is what Peter said. He said, no, guys and gals, look, that's, they're not drunk. God is up to something here. And he took them to scripture to show them. They had apostolic authority there. This is a great lesson to the church and, and for the messenger of the church, for the preacher in the church, the one who proclaims the word of God. When you know God is moving, then tell it to everyone, including the naysayers. Just simply preach the word. We have another pause here. And I will encourage you that re whoever stands in this pulpit, whether it's a permanent pastor, an interim, or a guest, or whomever it may be, you make sure they are simply preaching the word. You make sure. He has nothing else to say. Nothing else that you don't know. But we want to know what God says. So you have someone who preaches the word. This is what Peter did and it squelched the naysayers. So we move right along. Again, a natural outflow from that point to the next. In verse seven, uh, uh, the seventh thing, there is public proclamation of the word. In verses 14 and following, we, we've already read some of it, but Peter just flat begins to shuck the corn, if you will. He flat began to preach the paint off the walls. We see this done in several ways. To begin with, he, he preached God's providence. He speaks of prophecies and redemptive history in that passage we just read. Of God's providence... And of God's redemptive plan. He spoke about that. He proclaimed those things. Look at verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. So Peter preached God's providence, which includes those prophecies and redemptive history. But this was at the center of Peter's preaching. Jesus is foremost. He just preached Jesus. If you look at this sermon he preached, which was absolutely incredible sermon, it was a Christ-centered sermon. And that is indeed what the proclaimer of the gospel should do. Uh, again, I'm flabbergasted when I hear these nationally known preachers and they never mentioned Jesus. How does that happen? It's very familiar, uh, uh, reminiscent of what we looked at Wednesday night, the church at Laodicea, where they were rich and in need of nothing in their eyes, and Jesus was on the outside, Revelation 3.20, knocking on the door of the church. What a sad picture. And they were like, we really don't need Jesus. They'd gotten to that point because they were so self-centered and man-centered in their doctrine and in their practice. Jesus was on outside knocking. But that is absolutely as far from Scripture as we can get. 
Peter absolutely was Christ-centered in his preaching. It was Jesus everywhere. I love it when these kids talk about Jesus. It's amazing. It shows good instruction from their teachers and their guides and their Sunday school teachers and all that. That's what it's about. It's about Jesus. Again, we remember the words of of Charles Spurgeon, which even when he would read an Old Testament, or in, when he would preach from the Old Testament, he would, he'd said, he would read the text and make a beeline to the cross. Because the Old Testament is about Jesus, and the New Testament is about Jesus. The Bible is about Jesus. Amen. And this is what Peter's sermon was about. Preaching Jesus first is foremost. Look at verse... 23 and following. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by, by, the law, by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Aren't those sweet words? It was not possible for Christ to be held by the pangs of death. So he, he preached God's providence preaching Jesus as foremost. And then we see God's sovereignty in all the midst of it. Look again. Delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The death of Christ on the cross was not God's uh, uh, plan B. <laughs> it was in His plan from the beginning. Difficult for us to grasp, but it's clearly in Scripture. So... Jesus is at the, the center of Scripture. So let's take a look. Let's read this, these following verses concerning this, this, this message, this sermon that Peter was preaching. We'll begin in verse 25 and read down. For David says, now again, this is Peter preaching, and he quotes David. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he sat at my right hand that I might not, not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make uh, me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn an oath to him that he would uh, set one of his descendants on his throne. Again, he's beginning to point to Jesus now. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. That he was not abandoned to Hades nor his flesh uh, see corrupt, or nor, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Man, what a Christ-centered sermon. Just pointing people to Jesus. Which, here's another point. Exposition of Scripture brings conviction. This is what they, uh, Peter was doing. He was exposing Scripture. Exposition of Scripture means you see what is there and you pull out of what is there. That's where ek comes from. You pull out what is there and you proclaim that. That is what exposition of Scripture is. Ultimately, you, you do what your homework and you find out what the writer is saying because we trust that the writer was inspired by the Holy Spirit. We believe that. You find out what he's saying, and there are, there are ways of doing that, proper ways. You just simply pull that out, and then you proclaim it to the people. And when you do that properly, it'll be Jesus, Jesus, Jesus everywhere. Look at what Peter did. It's all about Jesus. He was quoting from the Old Testament, but you see Jesus. And when that happens, there'll be great 
conviction within the church, within whoever you're preaching to. How do I know that? Let's continue to read. Look at verse 37. Now when they had heard this, they were cut to the hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord has uh, our God calls to himself and with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. From what? The music? Nope. From what? Whatever else we could conjure up? Nope. From preaching the word. Amen. That's it. He said, after he finished preaching, they were cut to the heart because that's what exposition of Scripture does. It absolutely brings conviction and it draws people to God. When you lift up Jesus, when you preach the Word and it's Jesus everywhere, Jesus is high and lifted up and exalted and people are attracted to that. When Jesus is lifted up, man is shown for our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. And Jesus is that glaring Savior that stands before us. That's what preaching does. Proper preaching, man, you shouldn't be able to get enough of it. It hurts at times, doesn't it? <laughs> I understand. I mean, y'all just have to endure 40 minutes of it or whatever, how long I go. I have to endure it all week and study and and getting my toes stepped on. So it's kind of fun. I can put it out there for y'all. <laughs> but this is what preaching does. It brings conviction. And then from that, listen, not only does exposition bring conviction, but exposition of Scripture is evangelism. Amen. It absolutely is. Look at verse 38 again. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and so forth and so on. You want to see people saved? Preach the Word. That's it. Because it is the Gospel, the good news. That man has fallen, and we're sinners, and we're in dire, desperate need of a Savior, and Jesus is that glorious Savior. And we proclaim that. That brings conviction and it is indeed evangelism. So we'll narrow it down to this. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to realize the early church was set in apostolic truth from God. So we are to pattern ourselves after these truths. So that early church is a model for us, if you will. When I say apostolic truth, I mean these apostles were once sent forth by God with His message. And they set these things in place. And we are to model, so they are from God, they are truths from God. So we are to model ourselves after the early church. Second thing I want you to see is that we are to let God do His work. Isn't that simple? And isn't that liberating and freeing? We don't have to do it ourselves. We don't have to depend on our own power. We let God do His work. He does it a lot better than we do. And then finally, enjoy the ride. There are some of y'all that look like you had lemons for breakfast. <laughs> and really, why should that be? I mean, when we see this stuff, we ought to be like, wow, this is a glorious thing. God's in control. We're preaching Jesus, the glorious Jesus. I'm just going to enjoy the ride. It's an enjoyable thing, and that's what God wants us to do. Not like these folks who rose up and said, they're drunk. <laughs> no, just sit back and go, wow, look what God is doing. This is awesome. And enjoy the ride. Amen? Amen? Let's pray together.